Well, I'm a huge Jason Blum fan and Blumhouse fan. I think they've made some spectacular movies in the past many years, and I was fortunate to get to meet Jason and work with him, um, get to know him a little bit on the film Split by M. Night Shyamalan. I just thought he was this film producer, but no, he's like this really artistic guy. And, and I admire so much what he's created with Blumhouse. You know, he champions young filmmakers, and um, he, he's so creative. And like right now, he's 85 projects in the works. I mean, who does that? He's like old school, only this modern, wonderful man who's like champions artists, young artists, and other artists as well. And so when I came off the Hello Dolly tour, I did the national tour of Hello Dolly for a year in 2018 and 19. Um, right after I finished that, he offered me a film at Blumhouse by a young writer, first time director. And I was so exhausted uh, from the tour that I just felt like I couldn't do the film for him and I felt really bad about it. So I wrote him last summer saying, okay, I've got my you know, strength back and I, you know, What's that, what, what do you have out there that I can participate in? And he immediately, the guy's, he's such a mensch, like, you know, he doesn't make you wait a few days for his response to emails. He got right back that day and said, as a matter of fact, I have this script, I'm sending it to you now. And I was just so touched by that. So I read the script, I thought it was just very creative, this script. It's like his imagination gone wild. It's just like you can just see the contents of Jeff Wadlow's mind and dreams and nightmares, you know, and I totally like that. And I like that he takes a kid's imagination and turns it into a whole other dimension world that one can <clears throat> actually go to and experience. And the, I like the idea of the endless potential of imagination and to pay attention to a child's dreaming. That imagination can um, actually manifest in the world in a real way. And I think that's true. Everything that we experience and think about and believe in will happen, you know, in so many ways. And that's why it's mm -hmm. be really careful what you ask for, you know, because it'll come true mm -hmm. if you're not vigilant and say, yes to this or no to that, you know. So um, I like that thematically about the movie. I think fundamentally my character is just a very lonely, socially awkward, um, isolated person. So she's found her solace in books and as an ardent student of spirituality and the spiritual universe and magic and the occult. And she's done all this study and work to learn as much as she could about everything that's been written about that, about shamanism, witchcraft. And she's made herself this intellectual authority about all those things because of the influence of this significant time in her life as young Jessica's babysitter. And she's experienced such wonder through the eyes of that child. And then when she's taken away, it just rocked her world. And so she, you know, through her own desire to understand and desire to connect with that other dimension, she's written all these books and um, has sought to be understood in the world of intellectuals and has been rejected there as well because her ideas and her, what her notions are about this realm, they seem too far-fetched. Mm -hmm. So she's very anxious to prove that that's real. Yulin created the clothes and I just step into it, put on my crazy glasses. <laughs> Yeah, she's very creative, our, our uh, costume designer. And so the Asian kind of influence of the clothes, I think her aspiration was to be a, a kind of monk of no specific religion, but just the amalgam of all spiritual truth that's out there. And she's pulled it together in like her own explanation of the universe and her explanation of other dimensions. And so, but she thinks of herself as a kind of aesthetic, a monk. Mm -hmm. 
Jeff and I met on Zoom, and I just found him utterly charming. I mean, the guy's super handsome and just super enthusiastic. He's just so much fun. And so, again, I just felt like there's such joy being in his presence. And he goes, I want you to play Gloria. I mean, it was the easiest, <laughs> uh, you know, what do you have out there? I have this. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah. And so I was very excited, but they hadn't scheduled it yet. And he handles the horror movie genre, like you're tense and you're nervous at the right moment as you go through the spooky hallway. You know, he can make just the simplest shots uh, carry the suspense and the uh, fear factor. And I like that when the, um, a master of horror movie, stylistically horror movies, are also fun, you know, and there's a wit to it. I believe in my director and his incredible imagination. So I think it'll be great. Our set designers are out of this world, just filled with books and all of our research, and it's so eclectic. Just like, uh, you know, you go into the set and you're just like, oh, this tells me everything about who I am as a character. And they, you know, they showed me all the scrapbooks that Bonnie had made, these scrapbooks of her research about children's imaginary friends and stuff. And it was, it was, it's so precise and so vast what they've done. And the set design in The Never Ever just is mind-boggling. It's so beautiful. I mean, just the sketches were just so artistic and incredible. And to actually walk on the set, you're like, what? How did they make this? It's really, it's stunning. Yeah, I'm just really grateful to be here. And uh, like I said, I love Jason Blum and I love uh, Jeff Wadlow and the Wonder Wise, our wonderful, beautiful, talented, you know, powerful leading lady. I love working in New Orleans. It was so much fun to come back because I got to work with a lot of these people when I did Preacher here in uh, 2018. And so it was just a joy to come back. I love the city and I love the restaurants and I love the view from my hotel room. And I've been feeling kind of nostalgic about driving through the streets of New Orleans, like, I love New Orleans. You know, it's so much fun to be here and see my friends that live here. And then to get to reacquaint, um, you know, to be reunited with people on the crew that I worked with before. It's like you have a history with those people and they're so sweet. And yeah, I've had a really, really fun time. And I hope the movie from here uh, provides the audience and other people, anybody that, everybody that comes to see it uh, with a fun time, because that's what it was for those of us making this movie. When I first read the script, I didn't read it in one sitting because I got scared, so I stopped. And then I think mid-read, mid you know, my reps were like, Jeff is interested in meeting with you. So I said, let me go ahead and finish this scary script that scared me. And then I reached that turn, uh, which is, you know, Jessica's essentially her emotional arc of the story where she's, you know, in that nightmare sequence that I'm obsessed with that I think we hopefully executed beautifully and, and I was hooked. Probably, you know, the, the sort of uh, connection to me is I'm, I'm a mental health advocate and I love these kind of big genre stories that tap into something um, universal, something that, you know, uh, a lot of people or a good swath of people can really, really identify with. And, you know, childhood is, is not an innocent time. There was acknowledgement that there's a great mystery at the heart of childhood, you know, and so much that we experience that we don't understand. And those experiences really turn into trauma, you know, and Jessica experiences something very difficult very early in her life. And I think kind of, it's the heart of the story and it's, um, it's something that I really, really hope will resonate with a lot of people. She doesn't know yet, you know, she's, she's really refining and defining it over the course of our story. I think there's this beautiful thread that just breaks my heart where she's really trying to figure out what love is. Like, 
she's terrified that she doesn't know. She's terrified she doesn't know how to love. Um, she's terrified that she doesn't know how to receive it. You know, she has this deep insecurity around family, you know, that she doesn't feel like she knows how to be in a family. She's never been a part of a traditional kind of nuclear family. So in that respect, this experience, when we first meet her in this story, this is completely new. We know the superficial things about her. We know she's an illustrator. We know she's successful, she's published, but we don't know because she's still figuring out who she is in the context of this new role of motherhood that she finds herself thrust in. Tegan is one of the loveliest human beings I've ever met. We're shooting her introduction and I remember this moment where I was like, oh wow, you could feel underneath of Taylor in so many scenes. And so her sensitivity and her empathy and her vulnerability underneath of Taylor's veneer yeah. reads as like this depth of pain. That's how you receive it. So instead of it just being like, oh, you know, she's kind of a bitchy teenager. <laughs> you're like, oh, this is the girl who's hurting. This is the girl who's like, trying to move through this major transition in her life, you know, a move, a new stepmom, you know, all these major, you know, life transitions. And she does it with this degree of vulnerability that you might not get with another performer. Piper was our first choice and kind of our only choice. We were uh, praying every day that she would be, you know, cleared from Nickelodeon because, you know, I mean, really she needs none of us. Like Piper is gonna be a CAO one day. She's gonna probably be directing herself. She's such a filmmaker. She is a true, true, true pro. I want everyone to see her audition tape because it's just blew us away, not just her work and her emotional availability, but also her capacity of human understanding. Like immediately after her audition, she goes, okay, you know, let me shake it off. Jeff, can I tell you a joke? She has an awareness that many adult performers don't possess. I just wanna work with her for the rest of my life. She's, she's a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable young actress. Betty is so emotionally available. She takes what could be a very, you know, like one note kind of role and really like transmorphs it into this other beautiful thing. Like you realize when you're watching her work and you're watching Jessica and Gloria scenes together that Gloria was the only other person who was there and who actually is um, has an emotional connection to what happened. And you only get that with, you know, like truly phenomenal performers and, and ones who are open and willing and ready to receive, whether you're directing forthright or you're directing through performance. It's one of the rare times where I've met a director, you know, it, we met over Zoom. Um, you kind of have a, a very like fundamental, you know, ABC conversation about your working styles. And I feel like I got him rather quickly. Like I feel like I understood him. We have a very similar um, approach, you know to work, it's very rigorous, it's very demanding. We both have high expectations, but also clearly believe in, you know, kindness and neither of us are tyrants. And yeah, I just, I think Jeff is wonderful. I love his sense of humor. Um, I think he appreciates that he can be as direct as he needs to be with me and he doesn't have to like figure out how to say stuff, but he is a director who, you know, knows how to speak to each individual actors. There's a real sensitivity. You know, and I think this project, to be honest with you, probably required more vulnerability of him than he's probably experienced before. Like I felt that, um, I felt that across the board with our crew, but I think something that was super important to me was building the kind of set environment that felt safe to tell a vulnerable story and for 
everyone, including our director, to you know be vulnerable um, himself. It's a safe place to acknowledge all the uh, shadow parts of ourselves. You know, it's a safe place to admit when you feel embarrassment or shame or fear or anger or pain. And that's you know, what makes it special. It's uh, you, you feel it, you get to feel it in the dark, you know? <laughs> Especially, I mean, and specifically psychological horror. You know, it's one thing to watch a horror movie and it's, you know, gory or, you know, gross. And, and it's another thing to watch something where you're like, I have a fear of losing my mind, too. I remember the first time I was back in the theater you know, after COVID. And I cried because I, I was like, oh, everyone here is experiencing the same moment at the same time. Everyone's gonna receive, you know, something completely differently. It's like Taylor, for example, is kind of the voice of the audience in many ways. Like she gets to be the one who calls out anything that somebody might just be like, that's ridiculous. She literally gets to say like, this is crazy, you know? And it, a lot of audience members are gonna really identify with her character. Younger viewers are gonna identify, you know, with Alice. Um, so we all walk into stories with our own. Um, and it hits us in, you know, distinct and indecipherable ways. And one thing I love is we don't create art in a vacuum. We're not art for art's sake people. We are people who understand what we're doing as storytellers as a communal experience and we really invite the audience in uh, to tell us what the story is and to tell us you know what they walked away with and that's uh it's a part of the fun i had teddy rupskin i remember being very upset because i have an older brother hey Dwayne, who threw him down the stairs one day, and when I tell you, there's this moment, <laughs> there's an adjacent moment in our movie between Alice and Liam, and I was like, that was me. I was very protective over that teddy bear. Enigmatic, sinister, begrudging. Imaginary is a psychological horror film that takes a common childhood experience to terrifying extremes. The film follows an average family whose youngest child develops a relationship with a seemingly harmless imaginary friend. However, when a series of eerie and inexplicable events begin to unfold, they are forced to confront the horrifying truth. Chauncey is real and he is out for vengeance. The film blurs the lines between reality and fantasy and explores the psychological and supernatural elements of fear, revenge, and the enduring power of the imagination. Imaginary is an exciting addition to the legacy of Blumhouse horror films and contributes to the ever-evolving roster of iconic characters within our library. While each Blumhouse film has its unique elements, Imaginary stands out by introducing Chauncey as a memorable and distinctive character whose limits are only defined by those of your imagination. Iconic characters like Megan and the animatronics of Five Nights at Freddy's have left a lasting impact on the horror genre and on pulp culture. Chauncey's sinister wit and ability to change appearances offers the potential to join their ranks. This will be the third movie we do with Jeff Wadlow. We previously worked with him on Truth or Dare and Blumhouse's Fantasy Island. I have a lot of trust in his ability, so when he came to us with this idea, we were excited to explore the world. Jeff brings a unique vision and storytelling expertise to every project he's involved in, and his passion for the horror genre shines through in Imaginary. He has a strong understanding of what makes horror films resonate with audiences, and his creative approach to blending psychological horror with childhood themes is what made us so excited about this project. His ability to craft compelling characters and build tension is exceptional.
It adds layers of complexity to the story, making the characters more relatable and the tension more palpable. It also shakes up the typical horror movie formula and gets the audience thinking, which keeps everything interesting and full of surprises. Plus, it taps into deep emotions, making the horror experience more engaging and more thought-provoking. Taking a common childhood experience and cranking up the fear factor is all about tapping into something relatable and then twisting it in a way that unsettles viewers. We start with the familiarity of that innocent memory and gradually introduce elements that make it eerie or disturbing. The goal is to create a sense of unease and make the audience question something they once considered safe, turning it into a source of fear and suspense. The Spectral Motion team have extensive experience and immense talent when it comes to creating the best horror movie creatures. Robert Binion puppeteered Chauncey with insightful creativity in bringing Chauncey to life. Dane DiLiegro wore the Chauncey Beast suit and tapped into his athletic basketball background to bring the beast to life with the whole team of puppeteers. The entertainment value of horror is centered around fear, and the more a filmmaker can create a realistic fear, the more the audience will be immersed in the story and in the horror. There are instances where CGI can hit the mark, but audiences gravitate towards practical over computer-generated effects for a more authentic experience. We've found that having the actors and puppeteers work together to bring the film's creatures to life elicits the most genuine response. The film's aesthetics are carefully crafted to immerse the audience in a world that blurs the lines between reality and nightmare. The checkered walls of the Never Ever symbolize the distorted and surreal nature of the imaginary world and how the familiar can become menacing. The stark contrast between the bright childlike patterns and the increasingly sinister events that unfold within these walls create a sense of dissonance that heightens tension and unease. Its dimly lit, cramped, and labyrinthian design taps into common fears of confinement and vulnerability. The audience's fear of the unknown is amplified as characters venture into this unsettling space, not knowing what horrors might lurk in the shadows. DeWanda has an amazing ability to convey both vulnerability and strength. She brings a depth of emotion and authenticity to her character that allows the audience to immerse themselves in her story and feel invested in it. Betty is a horror legend. Her background in Broadway allows her to truly immerse herself into each role she plays, and Gloria is no exception. Betty had a unique connection to Gloria's costumes and the set of her home that shines through on the screen. Tegan, brings the perfect mixture of youth and adolescence balanced with mature life experience that allows her to effortlessly navigate the complexities for Taylor's character. Piper has this genuine, whimsical, childlike wonder that she balances with talent and professionalism. She's impressively adept with her emotions, which was a crucial part of Alice's character arc. I love that horror has this unique ability to elicit intense emotional reaction from audiences, and there are endless creative possibilities to explore. I was inspired to bring Imaginary together because I was challenged by Jason Blum to make a really slow, creepy movie, and I just wanted to try a very kind of slow, terrifying supernatural thriller. So to make a very slow, scary, supernatural uh, horror movie, you just have to turn the volume down, right? So you just have to slow down, you have to take your time, you have to allow the audience the moments to explore the negative space in the shots. And what that does is it allows them to use their imagination to project what evil might be lurking behind our main characters. A uh, major motif in the film is the artwork that our lead character creates. Jessica is an illustrator and she has a series of children's books called Molly Millipede. And she's taken a lot of these terrifying images from her 
dreams, but also from her past and try to understand them, try to work them out through her artwork and her books. So what's cool for me about that as a filmmaker is we're able to seed a lot of these ideas, a lot of these visuals, the, the hallway, the blue door, the spider. You see sort of the children's version of these things in these sort of Lewis Carroll-esque books, but you see how she's taken these things that have happened to her and she's tried to process them through her, her creative assets, right, to generate something that she can try to understand and share with the world. Dewanda Wise is playing Jessica Barnes in the film, and she, I mean, I just don't really have the words to describe Dewanda. She is magnetic, charismatic, um, vulnerable, strong, smart, insightful, empathetic. What I love about her is that she's bringing so much of herself to the role of Jessica, but she's also trying to create a character that's different than herself and different than some of the roles she's played in the past. Uh, she's an executive producer on the film. She's been just a, a tremendous partner and collaborator, and I, I've loved every minute of working with her. Piper, I mean, I can think of maybe two other times in my career when I've been in an audition, and when the audition finished, I went, uh, that's the person. I, we actually have an expression in Hollywood, we say, put them in makeup, which means like, get them to set, put them in makeup, they're in the movie. And I turned to my casting director after that audition, and I said, get her in makeup, she is it. And we had all these problems casting her, because she's you know, so talented, she was on another show, she was committed, and at one point it looked like we weren't gonna get her, and, and my partners at Blumhouse said, you might wanna think about someone else for this role, and I said, no, no, she's it. We have to have her, we have to have Piper, she's that kind of talent. Tegan is fantastic in the film. She is, brings the perfect mixture of sort of youthfulness and um, adolescence to the role, but also maturity and knowledge of life and experience. Uh, it's a hard line to walk. You know, a lot of actresses we looked at for the role, they seemed just too mature, they'd seen too much, you didn't buy them in this sort of adolescent phase still. But then we looked at some other actresses who read as teenagers, but they just didn't have the experience. Uh, you didn't see the, you know, the, that they were carrying any sense of trauma, right? That ultimately uh, Taylor has to bring to the movie. Uh, and watching Dewanda work with Tegan has been fantastic too. I didn't, I didn't speak about their dynamic yet, but it's been interesting to watch, whereas Dewanda is really focused in on Piper and, and having that sort of real kind of mentor connection with with Piper, almost parental. With, with Tegan, she's really developed a friendship and they seem like buddies, which at first you think is kind of weird, Tegan's 15, how is that possible? But Dewanda has created this bond with her that really translates to the screen because ultimately that is the central relationship in the movie is the relationship between Taylor and Jessica. So the way you make something wonderful, like a stuffed animal, creepy, is you just kind of make it off by like 5%. So you look at Chauncey, his eyes are asymmetrical, his, his ears are out of whack. And that's something that I really learned from James Wan that he talked a lot about when he looked at the script, because uh, he's a part of Blumhouse now. And, and we really leaned into that idea. And also implying that there's something else going on, like something childlike and wonderful is fine when it's in the foreground, but what's going on in the background? What if there's something else, something a little more sinister and that's where this idea of the entity came from too it was, it was a note from uh, James Wan as well this this notion that that the evil is not just the bear but it's actually something else that's manipulating the bear projecting the bear uh, for our characters to see the never ever is a place that's always shifting and it's a reflection of what you want and what you fear it's a kind of almost a, a tactile representation of your psyche you know in life we have all these choices we have all these doors we can walk through and I wanted the never ever to reflect that you should physically have just doors more doors than you can imagine and it's obviously influenced by the artwork of MC Escher and Salvador Dali so it has a surreal quality but it's still grounded in the real world if that makes sense
I will always choose a practical plus uh, VFX approach because what that does is it gives the actor something to play against. It creates a reality and it's not just for the talent on camera, it's for the audience in the theaters because they can feel the weight of something real. And so what you want to do is you want to trick the audience. You want to present something real so they're focused on the real thing. So the actors are focused on the real thing, but then you change something they're not looking at, right? So if it's if it's a, a puppet, right? You, you have the real thing there and there, there's rods, there maybe even is a puppeteer behind it, but you paint out the rods, you paint out the puppeteer, but the thing that they're looking at is the real thing. So that applies to sets too, you know? At one point we talked about, is the never ever just a CG set? I said, no, 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 we wanna, we wanna build a real set because this is a fantastic place and it has to have a weight, it has to have a reality to it. We have to believe that we're in a real place and then we'll just augment it with VFX. We'll do little things that make it seem a little bit more fantastical, but we wanna ground it in, in a reality. So our movie is set in Louisiana. It begins in New Orleans and they move into the suburbs. But we've made a choice to kind of get away from the cliche Southern Gothic thing. This is much more of a story about American families and American middle class, but also modern American families, blended families, people from different backgrounds coming together, but also people wanting to return to their roots, you know, to, to start to look back on their childhood and, and take the good parts and try to understand the, the parts that maybe weren't so good. So while it is very much set in Louisiana, I think it's really more of an, uh, a movie about Americana and the American family. And I've loved it. The crews are amazing. The producers I'm working with are so knowledgeable and confident. Paige and Paul have been tremendous partners. I've absolutely had the best time here. Everyone works so hard. They're so talented. Uh, if I could pick another place to go and shoot a movie, I would, I would pick here. I hope audiences take away from this film that imaginary friends might not be imaginary and that they can be a lot of different things to different people. They can be wonderful companions, they can be terrifying monsters, and they can also be vengeful spirits who will not let go. We want them to watch the movie and we want them to think about their own families and their own childhood and their own imagination and think about whether or not they had an imaginary friend and how they feel about that and realize that while that can be a beautiful thing, it also can be a really scary thing. We can also suggest that maybe that imaginary friend you had when you were a kid, maybe it wasn't as imaginary as you thought. And then that becomes a way to explore bigger ideas, bigger emotions, bigger themes. And I think just as the actors have found different themes and just as my collaborators have found different ideas to latch onto, I think the audience will find their own when they watch the film. I was excited to work with the Chaunceys. I didn't know there were multiple Chaunceys yet, but um, I was excited to work with Chauncey and see how he looked. I was excited to work with the monsters. Monsters were really exciting to see in person. Alice is at the new house getting out of her car and she sees this new house and it's a big house, it's a beautiful house. And Alice is the youngest daughter of the family. And she's been through a lot of trauma in her life with her mom, her biological mother. And that just makes her a little bit off. And that's why she finds love and confidence in this new imaginary friend. I think Alice really likes Chauncey because she can take care of something and love something and she just can play with someone and have someone to like kind of interact with. I think she was scared to go into through the blue door, but once she got into the imaginary world, she was happy and all her Badness went away. Dewanda is fabulous. She's just a very hard worker and she's she's a strong woman and it's it's really been great having her and Taken as my co stars.
Jeff was amazing to work with. He he really does love his job, and it's really fun to work with him because he's just great, and he really does do an amazing job. He doesn't really change your character. He lets you choose your character, and that really helps me. I don't know if it helps anyone else, but it really helps me just get into Alice. He never ever is scary. I've seen it a little bit and it looks really cool. It looks so cool and like kind of old looking almost. In the, the room, Alice's room, there's this little toy horse that I actually have, and it's the same horse. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have that at home. And that was like, it, it's not mine, but I do have it. And it was, it was really cool to see something that I own in, in the movie that I'm working on. It is crazy, but it is, the chaos is fun. It's just, there's so much happening, so it's like, you're like in the moment, so like, you're pulling, you, there's winds blowing, the entity, it's so much, but it's so crazy and it's so fun. It's like chaos, but it's like, the chaos isn't really chaos, it's like fun. It's fun chaos. I actually have a whole stuffed animal family, and it's stuffed bears. But now after this movie, I kind of want to get rid of them because bears are now creepy to me. But it's a bear family of my family, my mom, my dad, me, and my two older brothers. When I first read the script, I was super excited and just intrigued about the level of physical as well as emotional stuff that Taylor goes through in this film. I was really excited to be able to portray it and just be able to do that. <laughs> I would describe Taylor, I mean, she's a 16 year old girl. She's sarcastic. We find her at a place where she's pretty unhappy with the situation that she's in. and. She cares a lot about her younger sister, Alice, but she does not care too much about her stepmom, Jess. It's been so great, and she's super sweet, and I don't have a sister, I have three brothers, but working with her, I mean, we hang out a lot, and it's kind of like having a little sister that I never had, and she's super sweet and super fun to be with. <laughs> He's really great at creating an environment where we're all trying to support each other and reach that performance that is the best we can do. And I think at the beginning we had some great just talking through the character and her arc and Taylor and just really developing her and it was super helpful and he's great on set and just directing us and he's really great. <laughs> I have gone to work with Chauncey Bear. It's really cool how just how they take the face off of him. <laughs> I'd heard them talking about it a little bit, but I was like, I don't really understand what they're saying. And then I got on set and then they're like, okay, taking the face off. And then they just plop it off and then put a different expression on, which is so funny and so cool. <laughs> I hope that when they watch it, I, I just think it's such a well-written film and I think that it has like the perfect amount of jump scares and creatures and having them brought in and I think there's so many components that I really hope the audience likes and I hope that they're entertained and that they enjoy it. I had so many stuffed animals and I have a lot of siblings so they were grew out of their stuffed animals, they'd pass it down and but I had loads of stuffed animals and I was one of those kids that would just get into bed and have like 20 stuffed animals surrounded around them. So yeah, I mean, I think I definitely relied on my stuffed animals to keep me safe. <laughs>
Blumhouse have been on my list to work with for quite a long time. I really admire um, what they've done at that company, what Jason's done, and the movies that they create. And I had heard a lot of good stuff about how their sets are and, and um, how everyone has a good time. And, uh, and also, I hadn't done a horror movie like this before. I've done like, I've been out to Eastern Europe and done a horror movie. I've never done an American studio horror movie and that, that was attractive to me. Um, and it was also, it's a family story. It's the first time I played a dad uh, in a movie. Um, so that was a big step up for me and I am a dad in my private life now. And th there was a confluence of things that happened around the time that the project came in. And uh, I love the practical effects that are in the movie. Um, there isn't much CGI in this movie and that was really attractive to me. And the movies that I grew up with that I enjoyed um, were very practical and I think that makes it more scary. And I think this film is, uh, is a scary film because it feels real and um, yeah, tactile. Max is probably uh, the most centered person in the story, given that uh, one of his daughters is a teenager and the other one makes friends with a, um, a funny looking bear. <laughs> and um, uh, his wife in the movie, played by Dwanda, uh, has her own history. And, and, and I think in the movie, Max serves as a nice, stable um, person for them all to um, to feel at ease with and calmer around. And uh, it was nice for me to play that center of the movie. Um, but then he makes the mistake of going on tour with his band. And uh, so that, um, that emotional support is not there in the same way, and I think uh, the movie starts to move in a scary direction. Um, yeah, I was excited to work with Dwanda as well. Um, I'd seen her work in other things and, and had taken notice. She's a wonderful actress. And then, but more than that, uh, on a film like this where you're in every single day and you're the lead of the cast and the crew, uh, it's important, I think, that um, you have the right temperament um, and are capable of doing that because it's not just about the acting. And uh, I was happy to discover that Duana was just a fantastic leader of the cast and crew and knew her job in every single way, knew exactly what was required um, behind the scenes as well as in front of camera. And her character goes through very extreme situation in the movie and um, and she carries it with a plum and uh, and and this very um, you know her character in the movie doesn't have children and, and by her relationship with Max the children come into her life and and she's very um, uh, a loving presence in the movie for uh, Alice and Taylor as much as Taylor pushes her away uh, I, I think she feels that and um, and you see them their relationship changed during the movie, uh, which is really nice. Yeah, it's really fun to work with younger actors because they're in the first steps of their career. Um, having said that, both of them have been regulars on television shows and have a lot of experience at a young age. And I was really impressed with um, how professional they are. And not in a structured way, not in a way of like, this is how I have to behave. They just understand the job and turn up and do it. And there's nothing outside of that, which I really enjoy. You know, sometimes I have trouble with adult actors who like, there's lots of other extra stuff and it's not just about doing the job. Um, and actually, it's not just about doing the job. We had a really fun time and, and they're able to switch between the seriousness of the job and acting. Um, but then also have a good time and be a real person in the world. So that was really fun and, and, and just fun to see there's a moment in the movie where um, Tegan is really upset and I comfort her and just to see the skill of how she just turned it on and it was not fake, you know, she was chatting to me one moment and then in this really emotional moment the next. And the same with Piper, I, I mean they're both so capable and um, it was really fun for me uh, to watch them both do such great work in the movie and um, I'm really excited for them, actually. Um, Jeff is uh, a movie fan and uh, a big fan of uh, entertainment and entertaining audiences and wants to bring that, that's, that's, what you, that's what comes off of him when you're working with him. And, uh, 
I'm of the mind that we are there to entertain. Uh, we are there, there to entertain the audience, give them a good time, especially with a movie like this. Uh, and anything that adds to that um, is encouraged uh, on Jeff's set. And, and also it's a very egalitarian set, so best idea wins. Anyone who comes in and wants to make something better, uh, then it will be listened to. And, and I also like that. It's not, he's not dictatorial in his directing. It's very, he's very warm and approachable. And um, yeah, you just feel like he's doing it for the right reasons, basically. There's a scene uh, towards the end of the movie where uh, most of the cast are in it and um, we're all doing something a little bit different. Uh, and that was fun because everyone uh, has a journey in the movie. And then by the end of the movie, everyone is slightly changed in different ways. And uh, to play that scene at the end, um, which will be obvious when the audience sees the movie, um, was pretty fun because I got to do something that I hadn't done before. and. Uh, and relate to the characters in a different way, and it was that was fun. And then also, just any family scenes are just fun, you know, like um, with all, scenes with all of us together where we're just being a family. Um, was yeah, it's nice. I haven't done much working with um, younger actors, so that was just really lovely. Um, yeah, like playing a dad. I would describe Imaginary as one scary bear. Uh, real emotional childhood. No, I don't think so. <laughs> if I'm very honest, I think I blocked a lot of my childhood out <laughs> for different reasons. So I don't remember, and my wife thinks this is like pretty nuts. She's like, you don't remember anything? I was like, no, but are you supposed to in your 40s? I don't know, maybe more people do, but I, I remember certain things, but I don't remember ever having any kind of imaginary friend. But as I do have a two-year-old now, and he is becoming more aware of the world and things around him, I, I definitely am seeing how children can be very scary. <laughs> and, and just in how, because it's something about like, when a child wakes up in the middle of the night and is crying, which has happened, uh, it's kind of terrifying. Because also, they, when they're younger, they can't talk to you. So they can't tell you what's wrong. That's really scary, uh, actually. It's generally a simple thing that you can fix. But, but you have to figure out what that is. And, and there's a panic uh, that can come with trying to fix or help your child. Um, and I can see how a year or two from now, when my son is able to talk, it could be even worse because <laughs> he'll be panicking and then he'll say something terrifying and then I won't know what to do. <laughs> I think it'd be pretty similar to Chauncey. Uh, well, or actually, my son likes crocodiles and there's something really um, creepy about crocodiles and their big smiling mouths and lots of teeth and especially like cartoon crocodiles, which would be like a like a uh, cuddly toy. So, yeah, I think a, a, a crocodile plushie. Uh, I think it's important to see imaginary in theatres because the communal experience of going to the cinema um, is only made better by seeing movies with other people. Um, because you like to feed off other people's reactions. And it's like when someone laughs in a room, you feel more comfortable with laughing. So when someone is watching a horror film like Imaginary and they get scared, they're not embarrassed to be scared if there's other people in the room who are also scared. And then it becomes fun. And then it becomes like a roller coaster. And I think that's what horror movies do really well. And I had described the Blumhouse movies as theme park rides because to me that's what they are. You go in and you, 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 know, you start chugging along at the beginning and then you go up the slope and you're learning all the things along the way and then you just get dropped off a cliff and you go through the, the loop and everything. Uh, and this movie absolutely 100% does that. Um, it takes you, uh, it takes you on a journey, and um, you do a lot of loop the loops before you reach the end. Uh, I hope fundamentally, I hope everyone's very entertained. I think that's um, the whole point of a movie like this is that it's a lot of fun, and that you 
you're kind of, you laugh at yourself with some of the scares and you know, you jump and then you, you laugh afterwards because it's like the nervous laughter of being scared. Uh, I think this movie um, harkens back to like 80s horror movies. It has like something about it that is very grounded. It goes to some very wild places, but at its heart, it's a really grounded emotional story. Um, and I think if we grab the audience's emotions at the beginning, we can take them anywhere. And I think uh, this movie achieves that. And um, it, it's fun. I think ultimately you should come away feeling like you've been on a fun theme park ride um, and you want to see more. <laughs>